Welcome back, everybody. For this mini lecture, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about social psychology. Well, kind of. You see, social psychology aims to examine lots of different things, and a lot of social psychologists dedicate their time to examining the problems that we have in this world and seeing what we can do about them. Things like crime, violence, discrimination, and war. They examine why it happens, where it happens, who does a lot of it, and who doesn't do as much of it, to try to figure out what it is we can get out in front of. But even given decades of research, we have a really hard time stopping things like this. We might have a good answer as to why that is if we look not at social psychology, but at evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology aims to examine people as people. Uh, not necessarily evolve for the world we're in now, but evolve for a di very different one. And once we start to examine the things that we do that can be really problematic, we start to see that maybe they're not problems at all. They're just advantages, adaptations for the wrong environment. You see, the people we are, you and me, we are biologically the same creatures we were 40, 50, 60,000 years ago, before there was written or spoken languages, when we were living in small familial local groups. Of course, long before things like computers and the internet and Twitter and 24-hour news cycles. What this means is that even though our world has changed immensely, and we do lots of things we couldn't do back then, our brains are pretty much exactly the same, and they want to do a lot of the same things that they used to do then. What we can do now is examine some things like aggression and altruism, two of the biggest things in social psychology, two of the biggest forces that affect our behavior, and examine why they might happen in this kind of evolutionary context. Now on the face of it, altruism doesn't seem to be a problem at all unless you're talking in an evolutionary way. After all, 50,000 years ago, if I had some food and I shared it with you, that might not seem to be a very good idea. After all, I just helped you survive a lot and maybe I didn't help myself out. After all, I have less food than I used to. Now, most of you guys can probably figure out what the real reason is. We share like that. Now, we share because it helps us feel good. We share because we love each other. We share because we care about the people we're sharing with. But from an evolutionary perspective, one of the reasons that we share is that even though it may hurt me in some small way right now to not have that food, having your friendship is worth a lot more. And I don't just mean because of a warm, fuzzy feeling. I mean because you and me and our friends, we can do things together that I could never do alone. A little extra food right now is really good, but what's a lot more important is that you and me and all of our friends, we can take down a buffalo, we could take down a mammoth, we could fight off a wolf or a bear. In this way, we can take the common phrase that lots of people know, survival of the fittest, which means that pretty much the individual that fits best in the environment is the one that's going to survive and have kids that carry on with those genes. We can extend it not to just mean survival of the fittest individual, but instead survival of the fittest group. And this is why we see altruism being an important thing for us to have. Now, at the same time, we can take the same kind of perspective and we can examine things that we would think we don't want, things like aggression. Now, altruism usually means doing something that helps someone else out at a cost to yourself. So whether it's sharing food or sharing money or helping someone else when you don't need to help them, that's altruism. Aggression is the opposite. Aggression means doing something that harms someone else, usually for your own personal benefit. And that's the kind of behavior that we don't like to see a lot of. It's what seems to sit at the core of things like discrimination, racism, war, violence, and crime. People doing selfish things that they wouldn't normally do. Now, given the fact that we just talked about survival 40,000 years ago, you might start to see why aggression is something that's hardwired into our genes. After all, being aggressive a long time ago when you lived in a small group was a good idea. If you were aggressive, you could look out for yourself, you could be dominant, you could make others respect you, but most importantly, you could take what you needed in order to survive. After all, a long time ago, in an environment like that, there wasn't nearly enough of anything. Now, we tend to see that people... We see that people tend to be more aggressive in situations that make sense in this way. People are more aggressive when they're hot, when they're uncomfortable. In the wild, if you're uncomfortable, if you don't feel good, you're likely threatened. You need to look out for yourself. You're going to fight off people who tend to take advantage of you. We tend to be aggressive when we feel threatened, when we feel that someone's disrespected us. You get angry when someone cuts you off in traffic, not because they delayed you by three whole seconds, but because you feel disrespected. And 40,000 years ago, if you let someone get away with disrespecting you, they could take your food, they could take your security, they could take your mate, they could take your life. So when you feel disrespected now, your genes want you to fight. We feel aggressive when we're hungry. 
as my fiance is fond of reminding me, when I start to seem grumpy, when I start to seem upset about something, she asks me how long it's been since I ate. Now you can imagine that's something that makes me feel even more aggressive, but she's right. A recent study coming out of Israel showed that when judges were in charge of parole hearings, um, regardless of the specifics of the case, when somebody was going for a parole and their hearing tended to come up immediately after lunch, right after everybody ate, they had a two-thirds chance of receiving parole. If exactly that same person had a case that came up immediately before lunch, they had exactly a 0% chance of receiving parole because the ju those judges were hangry or aggressive. And this makes a lot of sense in an evolutionary context. If you don't have enough food, you're going to be aggressive. You're going to keep people away from what you have, and you're going to try to fight them for what it is you need. We also tend to see, of course, people are more aggressive if they're under the influence of things like drugs and alcohol. And certain kinds of people are more aggressive than others, or at least it would seem. It would seem on the face of it that men and people from individualistic cultures like the United States are more aggressive than women or people from collectivistic cultures, like those in uh, East Asia and South America. In fact, what we see is that this isn't a difference in the amount of aggression, but just a difference in the kind of aggression. Men tend to be more directly aggressive, as do Americans in general. I don't just mean in terms of physical aggression, but also just getting out what it is you need to get out. Men are more likely to fight with each other, men are more likely to argue, men are more likely to just get their problems out in the open, whereas women tend to be more indirect as do people from East Asian, South American, or Eastern European cultures. Now, your textbook, other books may argue that this is in part for evolutionary reasons. And we did just talk about evolutionary psychology, that perhaps women need to protect themselves because they're going to be carrying children or some nonsense like that. In fact, what we could say is that this is cultural training. After all, if two boys get in a fight on a playground, yeah, they're going to get in trouble. Yeah, they're going to be told they shouldn't fight. But ultimately, we're all going to shrug our shoulders. We're going to roll our eyes, and we're going to say, well, boys will be boys. What matters more than anything is that my kid beat up your kid. If two girls get in a fight on the playground, we don't have nearly the same kind of setup. After all, if you get in a fight, something that you're not supposed to do, something that's unladylike, this is a violation of who you're supposed to be. It's a violation of what it is your parents have taught you. It's unladylike. It's not proper. You're not supposed to fight. You're an embarrassment to yourself. You're an embarrassment to me. And you ruin that beautiful dress that your parents just got for you. Your parents end up sending the message that not only you're not supposed to look out for yourself, but your appearance matters more than anything. Does this mean that women aren't aggressive? Far from the opposite. What it means is that women tend to express their aggression differently, using indirect or relational aggression. Instead of fighting directly, they might talk behind someone's back, exclude them from conversations, find ways to make that person feel bad, to know that they're being punished without resorting to direct conflict or physical aggression. This is where a lot of things like cyberbullying come into play. We see the same thing take place in um, cultures that are collectivist in nature, that instead of using direct aggression, there's a lot of relational aggression at play. So as we see things that happen, good things, bad things. I want you to think not just how they might benefit us now when trying to figure out why it is somebody does something, but try to figure out how it could have benefited us 40,000 years ago. I'm not saying that things like crime and war and discrimination are good things, just that they're really, really hard to get rid of because there's something that used to benefit us a long time ago.